Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Books and Books, right here in the cultural heart of Coral Gables. My name is Steve Moss. I'm the manager here at the bookstore. On behalf of everyone here, welcome. While you are silencing your cell phones, uh, I'll show you our Books and Books monthly newsletter. This will give you a synopsis of all the great events we have at Books and Books uh, every night of the week. We have something for everyone. We've got Spanish events. We've got kids events. We've got first-time authors, poetry readings, uh, even celebrity signings. You can pick up a copy of this, of course, at the counter where tonight's books are being sold. You can also go online to our website and give us your email address uh, so you don't miss a thing. We'll send you blasts of whatever comes up. And as you can see by the lights and cameras here in the store, we do live stream uh, many of our events uh, through the internet, uh, so wherever you are on the planet, if you're watching, welcome as well. Um, I also remind you that flash photography is prohibited because it interferes with the live stream presentation. Um, take a copy of the book, uh, the, the newsletter, or as I say, go online, give us your email address uh, so we can keep you apprised of everything that goes on. And as I say, while we don't need to necessarily have you in the store, we love to have you here. You don't need to be. You can always call the store and uh, order a copy of the book that's uh, to be signed for you while the event is in progress, or even to ask a question of the author while the event is in progress. And I will say again uh, that we do have a few cameras pointed at the audience, uh, so for the benefit of those that are watching, um, please make sure you're sitting next to who you're supposed to be sitting next to. Shotgun houses, vibrant street scenes, grand villas and mansions, colorful facades, they're all part of a historically rich, interconnected Creole world. New Orleans is often hailed for its distinctive Creole heritage, evident in its food, architecture, and people, but it's far from alone. Its Creoleness may be unique to the United States, but New Orleans is part of an entire family of Latin Caribbean cities with similar colonial histories. Founded as New World outposts of Old World empires, these cities forged new identities from European, West African, and indigenous influences by turns inspired by, in defiance of, and adapted from all of them. In Creole World, author and photographer Richard Sexton explores architectural and urban similarities among these cultural cousins from Haiti, Colombia, Argentina, Cuba, Bolivia, and Ecuador, back home to New Orleans. Setting the stage for the book's 200 color photographs are essays by Creole architecture scholar Jay Edwards and photography historian John Lawrence. Together, they take readers on a fascinating journey across time and place through the ever-changing Creole world. Richard Sexton is a fine art and media photographer whose work has been published and exhibited worldwide. Born in Atlanta and raised in Colquitt, Georgia, his work has been published in Archetype, Harper's Photographer's Forum, and View Camera Magazines, as well as many others. Creole World is his 13th book, joining such titles as Terra Incognita, Photographs of America's Third Coast, and the best-selling New Orleans, Elegance and Decadence. Please give him a warm Books and Books welcome, Richard Sexton. Thank you. It's great to be at Books and Books, and thank you all for coming. Um, being a visual person, I'm going to show you some pictures of the, of the book and of Creole World. Uh, this is the cover. Uh, the title, Creole World, Photographs of New Orleans and the Latin Caribbean Sphere. I'll say a, a bit about uh, the two essayists, which Steve mentioned to you. Jay Edwards is a Creole scholar and notably the author of Creole Lexicon, a book I highly recommend. And John Lawrence has contributed to uh, many books, including uh, Terra Incognita, a title we worked on previously. Uh, but in the vein of Creole world, most notably, he is the writer for Creole Houses. Um, there's an adage about New Orleans, that it's the northernmost Caribbean city. And that's certainly not an idea that I came up with. It's a very old idea. Uh, and many have remarked on it, from uh, Lafcadio O'Hearn to Liebling to uh, a number of uh, writers and artists. But I, just, I didn't want to just remark about it. I really wanted to show the visual similarities between New Orleans and its cultural kin in uh, other parts of the Caribbean and Latin America. It's regarded in the United States as being a completely unique place. Uh, and when people tell me that, I always ask them, have you ever been to Latin America? Because it's more typical than you think in a lot of regards. So I had a very simple concept here, but somewhat difficult to execute. I needed to go to a lot of places. Here's a map from the book that shows every town that's uh, marked on the map is a place where the photographs uh, in Creole world originated. 
Uh, and so you can see it's uh, pretty heavy in the Caribbean, but also includes uh, Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, and uh, Buenos Aires as well. There's a few photographs from there. It's also an exhibit. And I wanted to show you some photographs of the exhibit, uh, which is uh, up until December the 7th, for those of you who might be visiting New Orleans uh, before then. And also, I wanted to show the exhibit because it will travel. And one of the locations we would love to see the exhibit come to is Miami. So uh, stay tuned for news about that. One of the things that I'm doing while I'm here is looking at possible venues for the exhibit. Um, the exhibit is in the French Quarter uh, at the Perriot Building, which is one of uh, several buildings uh, that the Historic New Orleans Collection owns. And it's a Spanish Creole building. It was built during the Spanish period in the uh, late 18th century, and it's what we call in New Orleans an entresol building. There's commercial on the ground floor. Then where the transoms are is a storage floor. It's a very low ceiling. You have to duck down, and this is where the goods were stored, and then the family would live upstairs. So it, was, it has a kind of a buffer floor between, and that was a, a Spanish innovation. And the galleries, uh, the Laura Simon Nelson uh, galleries for Louisiana art, are on the ground floor. So this is one of the rooms uh, of the exhibit where photographs of New Orleans are paired with images from somewhere else in the broader Creole world. It also includes uh, one of my favorite quotes about New Orleans. And uh, I'll come over here so I can read it to you. It's from A.J. Liebling, the great journalist who worked for The New Yorker. New Orleans resembles Genoa, or Marseille, or Beirut, or the Egyptian Alexandria more than it does New York. Although all seaports resemble one another more than they can resemble any place in the interior. Like Havana and Port-au-Prince, New Orleans is within the orbit of a Hellenistic world that never touched the North Atlantic. The Mediterranean, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico form a homogeneous, though interrupted, sea. New York and Cherbourg and Bergen are in a separate thalassic system. Uh, this is from his book, The Earl of Louisiana. That was written in 1960. Liebling was in Louisiana because he was covering a major national event. Earl Long, who was the governor, had been committed to a mental institution, yet he was still governor. That had never happened before. It hasn't happened since. <laughs> it was a national story, and he was there covering it and observing. And he actually made this comment when he had to leave New Orleans and go up to North Louisiana where something was happening. And he had been used to dialing it, dining at Arnaud's and Galatois, and he was out kind of in the sticks, and he, he couldn't get a good meal. And he realized that he had culturally left this little place that was kind of isolated. Here's some other photographs of the exhibit. Um, there are three rooms. There are also two cases of artifacts in the uh, exhibit. I wanted it not just to be about the contemporary photographs, but also about other things. And they're curious things. In this particular case, uh, on one side, it's, it's my political mementos from Latin America, posters from Somoza, the dictator of Nicaragua, and Che Guevara, things like that. On this side of this particular case are things that I picked up along the way. Uh, there's a bowl made from a, a truck tire, a purse made from beer can pop tops, things like that. And one of the most memorable things for me is when I was in Colombia, I was very proud of my Spanish. Hablo un poco de español como un niño de cinco años. And I actually thought that I might be able to read Marquez in Spanish. And I bought this little book. It had never been translated. I don't think it has yet. Ojos de Perro Azul. It didn't happen. I couldn't read it. But it's in the case. Uh, Forty years later, uh, I, I still have the book. Uh, and I want to mention Marquez later. But at any rate, I wanted to kind of historify uh, my experience in, in New Orleans and Latin America. There's another case of things from my very first grand epic trip to Latin America, which occurred 40 years ago. I was 20 years old. I drove a Datsun station wagon to Bolivia and back. 
the station wagon actually only made it to Panama, but I made it to <laughs> Bolivia and back. And I took pictures, and I wanted to learn how to be a photographer. So this is a, uh, the, some of the photographic equipment that I was using at that time with some of the old road maps and other things, the South America Handbook, which had just been published. It was a first handbook, uh, a guidebook to every country in, in, in uh, Latin America. So there I am 40 years ago. This is in Colombia with my camera, as you can see, I haven't changed. Uh, and uh, so this is about midway on the trip. And uh, here's the Datsun station wagon. This was in Guatemala. We were on a ferry. And here are some of the photographs uh, that I took 40 years ago, a small number of which are in Creole World. For my forward for Creole World, we use some of these old photographs. And at the exhibit, there's a monitor with a, a revolving slideshow of, of all of them. It was quite an experience. It was sort of a life-forming experience for me. And uh, for this trip, I should say that I, w I was only 20. And prior to the trip, I had not traveled beyond Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. I lived in Georgia. We're, we're driving from Georgia. New Orleans was the first stop on the trip and the only North American stop. We spent the weekend in New Orleans and then made a beeline for Mexico. This is Belize which was newly named Belize. It was, had only been independent a couple of years, formerly British Honduras. So I spent six months photographing and developed a love affair with Latin America. And bear in mind, I had not seen New York or Chicago or Los Angeles or any major American cities at this point. So I was actually exposed to the Latin American places first. This is Panama, El Chirio, and, and uh, Ciudad de Panama, which I would go back to more recently. And many photographs from Creole world are, are more contemporary images of this neighborhood. I also photographed in color a little bit. Mostly I was shooting black and white. Color was very expensive and particularly at that time I wanted to be a serious photographer and black and white was more, you know, uh, de rigueur, I'd say, for that process. Uh, but this is a color photograph from Hetsimini in the market uh, in Cartagena. And in the background, and I'll show you a detail, was one of my first uh, sort of um, uh, hints at the complexity of the Creole world. Uh, Almasan, uh, Carlos Wong Warehouse. Uh, and uh, of course, the Chinese are a prominent part of the Creole mix, particularly in Cuba, uh, in Panama, also in Colombia. And so I, I thought this was just a very cool name. And it, it gives some of the clues of what the essence of Creole is all about, the mixing together of different cultures in a new place and a, a new culture forming from that, combining the old and the new. Well, fast forward 17 years, I moved to New Orleans from San Francisco, and I proceeded to do books about Louisiana and other places too, but there were many notable experiences. This is my first Louisiana book. Uh, New Orleans Elegance and Decadence. Also did a book on uh, the River Road, Vestures of Grandeur. These were both published by Chronicle in San Francisco. The most recent book before Creole World is New Roads and Old Rivers, which is about Point Coupe Parish. And Point Coupe is one of the three surviving indigenous French settlements in Louisiana. New Orleans and Natchitoches are the other two. Natchez was one, but Natchez was, uh, everybody was killed in Natchez through an Indian uh, uprising. So they abandoned that one. Uh, but Point Capi 
is one that survives today and is a very, very Creole pa uh, place because it's rural and isolated and everybody has a French name and uh, a few people still speak Creole, which is very rare in Louisiana today. So out of all of these experiences of uh, going to Latin America as a very young person, then living in New Orleans for 23 years now, I came to appreciate the relationship between New Orleans and all the places that it was connected to. Uh, it's, it's kind of a lone example in the United States of a place founded by the French, then taken over by the Spanish, then sold lock, stock, and barrel to the Americans. And North America today comprises a lot of pieces of other uh, European colonial powers, Florida being a notable example. Uh, although the British were here for a period of time, it was originally Spanish. But there weren't many people here, and there certainly weren't any large cities. New Orleans was a large city for its time, and it immediately became one of the largest cities as soon as it was bought in, in um, the United States. So uh, I decided what I would do is I went, I traveled, and when I saw something that reminded me of New Orleans and Louisiana, I took a picture. And I didn't have to think about it beyond that. Now, putting everything together later required a great deal of thought to sort of establish uh, the relationships between things and what belonged. But in any case, at this particular uh, time, I was in La Reina, Cementerio, in Cienfuegos, which has a very special relationship to Louisiana, which I'll talk about a little more when there's some other pictures, but I saw this gate and I was in the cemetery which could easily have been St. Louis I in New Orleans, but it was in Cuba. And I saw the gate, I photographed it, I knew I'd seen the gate before, I, I, and I knew I'd seen it in New Orleans, I just wasn't sure where. It did take me four months to find it, but it turned out to be in St. Louis III, uh, which is the oldest of the cemeteries uh, named after uh, Louis the Ninth. Uh, but uh, it was just such a unique coincidence to find these two uh, uh, artifacts, one from Cuba and then one from New Orleans. Here's another example. This is in Treme, two houses. The house on the right is a, is a Creole cottage and uh, then an Italian shotgun house on the left uh, painted in very bright tropical color, what we would describe as Creole color in, uh, in uh, New Orleans. And I juxtapose that with this scene from El Torillo in uh, Panama, where you have also a Creole building on the right, more classical building on the left, both uh, with a lot of very rich, vivid color. And there's also another element here that I think is a, that, that's an important part of the Creole world. And the little grouping of, of people mingling on the sidewalk there, you see people that appear to be of pure European descent, you see people that appear to be of pure African descent, and you see the complexions in between. So here are these two. This is a uh, facade on Paseo Pasa del Prado in uh, Havana, and I juxtaposed it with the house across from me that I had photographed in the late 90s. I lived in the quarter. I lived right behind the cathedral. And these are my neighbors across the street uh, who have decorated their front gallery with a Cuban flag, an homage to Fats Domino, who is a Creole. His, his, Fats was his nickname, but his, his, his name was Antoine, Antoine Domino, and a, 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 a plastic marlin there for some reason. I don't really know. Um, it kind of. Uh, the Fah's categorization there, but you can sort of see the relationship there of you have this very grand architecture that's really been sort of funkified by the way people are living in it. And uh, uh, that's, that's a common trait that I saw, particularly between Havana and uh, the French Quarter in New Orleans, which is kind of one of America's most uh, beloved bohemias. This is a, a little cottage in Hetsimini in Cartagena, uh, similar in form to our Creole cottages 
uh, in uh, Louisiana, and also you can see it sort of derived from the Casa Colonica of, uh, of uh, Latin America. And I juxtaposed it with this detail of a, a Creole cottage in the Marigny, which is the neighborhood just below the French Quarter, which was restored to its original Creole colors uh, by the current owner, who was the director of preservation studies at Tulane. And he did scrapings to get back to what the original colors were. Uh, it had been painted white with green shutters in modern times, and he got back to the original colors. Uh, here's another, oops, I think I did something there. Here we go. Sorry about that. Wrong button. Here's another, uh, this is actually a hybrid cottage. It's a Creole house form with four rooms en suite, but it has uh, it's kind of more American detailing. It doesn't have French doors, etc. Paul Pochet lives here. And again, another house painted white, but he went to Oaxaca for vacation and came back and did this to his house <laughs> after he saw all the color down there. So you see it going the other way in this particular case in a totally vernacular way, nothing scientific about it. It's like the inspiration of Latin America and he's bringing it back to New Orleans and, and putting it on a, on a house that has a lot of Creole elements to it. This is New Orleans. Uh, a photograph of the French Quarter. And what I wanted to do here, and in the book there are four of these, I wanted to show the historic districts that I was photographing in detail to really emphasize what you see throughout the Creole world and, and, and Latin America. At the center of the heart of the town, there's always a plaza. The most uh, prominent edifice on the plaza is the Catholic Church. And we have that in New Orleans. And it, it's flanked by the Cabildo mm -hmm. on the left and the Presbytery on the right. So it has all the classic elements identifying it as a Catholic city. And St. Louis Cathedral is the oldest cathedral in North America. No, I take that back. And I, the United States. The United States, not North America. We, with Canada. It, they have an older one. And I juxtaposed it with this view of Cartagena. And in this case, the plaza is on the other side of the church. But this is a church where uh, San Pedro Claver is buried. And the knights, in, in New Orleans, he's known as Peter Claver. And the Knights of Peter Claver are a very important Creole organization uh, there. And so that's a very strong connection between the two. But I really wanted to show the prominence of the church in the skyline of the old cities. Now here's what has become, in a backdoor kind of way, the lead image in Creole world. The, uh, the first section of the book is called Creole Overture, and that's where the essays are, and my uh, forward is there. And so it really is an overture in the true sense. It's an overview. And I put this as the very last image in the uh, Creole Overture, which is the front matter of the book. So as I said, in a backdoor kind of way, it becomes the lead image for the book. And uh, this is Parque Central in Havana. And I'm photographing the statue there of Jose Marti, George Washington of Cuba. But I'm on the wrong side of the statue. The plaque's on the other side. The statue faces the other way. I'm about to take a completely meaningless photograph when this gentleman steps right in front of me, and when he's aligned with the statue, I take the picture. And, you know, for me, it became very emblematic of uh, the Creole world. You have Jose Marti, the European Creole, who was uh, fighting for Cuba's independence. And Cuba today is, is very much a mixed-race country. Uh, and uh, so, in this case, I think uh, life is sort of inform informing art. Now, back to Cienfuegos. This is a, a street scene from Cienfuegos of a little house very much like a Creole cottage, very evocative of that. Now, here's the Louisiana connection with Cienfuegos. It was founded uh, by, uh, we pronounce his name Clouet, uh, it's probably Clouet if you speak French, uh, and he was a Frenchman in service to the Spanish crown, 
And after the Louisiana Purchase, he took a group of Louisiana Creoles who did not want to be American. They were very upset about the Purchase. And they, after a few years, they had petitioned the Spanish crown, and they got a land grant in Cuba. And so Clouet took, there were also some settlers from Bordeaux. Clouet was from Bordeaux and uh, from Louisiana. And they uh, went to Cuba and founded Cienfuegos. So uh, it, it has this Louisiana connection. I don't think it's really fair. I read in some of the guidebooks that it was actually, they, they referred to Clouet as, as being a Louisianan. And although he lived most of his life and his military service was in Louisiana, I, I think he would probably be French. Uh, and so, uh, but he had a strong Louisiana connection. And so there are many families that are, um, uh, the, the old families in Cienfuegos have a prior history in Louisiana. And you can sort of see that in the architecture. And I noticed that in Cuba, they would call Cienfuegos the French town. And this is one of the, say, and, and in New Orleans, throughout the French Quarter, you'll see many, many buildings that are very similar to this, very similar pattern in terms of the uh, uh, scale of the windows, the detailing uh, of the facade, all of that. Here is a villa that would be very at home on Esplanade Avenue in New Orleans, but it's in Hetsemane in Cartagena. And I wanted to mention uh, Marquez again, because one of the things that I realized eventually, not right at first, but eventually I did, uh, there are two writers that I referenced in my foreword. Tennessee Williams was one, and Marquez was the other. And I eventually realized that what I was doing is trying to photograph the world that they were writing about. And particularly in terms of this image, I can see the little girl who lives in the house. That's a house that I can't remember now if it's her grandfather. I think it was probably her great-grandfather built. And I could just sort of envision her as being from the Buendia family in San Años de Soledad. Uh, and I really do think that uh, Williams with you know, a streetcar named Desire and, and Marquez with so many of his works, uh, what I was really trying to do is, is photograph the world that they were writing about. Here's a photograph from uh, Jacques Mel in Haiti. It's a street scene that's very much like a scene that we're familiar with in New Orleans, and particularly with the use of cast iron in the building on the right. And Haiti has so many connections to Louisiana, not just because it's also a former French colony, which it is, but after the slave revolt, and uh, a lot of the Haitians fled Haiti, uh, a huge number of them came to Louisiana. That's where most of the refugees ended up. And it was by way of Cuba that most of them arrived. And um, it was a huge influx in the early uh, 19th century, just after New Orleans had become um, American. It was trying to become American. And then you have all of these Haitian Creoles arriving. Uh, to, to give you a sort of a feel for how significant, well, they doubled the population of the city, and this was 200 years ago. So many, many, many people in New Orleans now have Haitian ancestry because they intermarried with the people from Louisiana, and uh, it, it, the list is, is long. Some of them that you may not, uh, Audubon, for instance, John James Audubon, he was Haitian. Uh, uh, Plessy, Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court case, Omer Plessy was, his grandfather was Germain Plessy, who was Haitian. So he was of, of Haitian descent. And interestingly, a lot of people don't know the story that he actually, uh, Plessy appeared to be white. That's why he was allowed to sit in the white car to begin with. It was kind of a setup. Because the Creoles in Louisiana could not imagine that they would be considered black. They thought of themselves as being of mixed race which they were, and so, okay, you've got laws for white people, you've got laws for blacks, but what about the people that are somewhere in between? And they felt confident that they would win, and eventually they did, but it was 70 years later before it was overturned. But at any rate, that's just a little bit of, of sort of the 
Haiti, Louisiana uh, connection there. When, and to get back to the photograph, one of the things that I tried to do is uh, not just photograph the architecture, but give some sense of the street life. And I'm photographing here on a Sunday because the market is closed, and it would, ordinarily it would be too, too much hustle and bustle to even get in there and take a photograph. But it's a Sunday afternoon, and here's a little couple of vignettes of what was going on. The, the guy holding up a sheet of paper was, was reading something to the woman who's distracted by the weird photographer out there and wondering what's going on. Uh, and they're washing their clothes and uh, taking care of Sunday chores, uh, getting the hair just right for Monday. Uh, and then also a chicken wandered in to the shot. And I have to say that if there were a, an official bird of the Creole world, it should be the chicken. <laughs> because everybody has them. And in New Orleans, it's, there are people in, in my neighborhood in the Marigny that, that uh, raise chickens and guinea hens, and they're all over the neighborhood. There's another scene. This is from Cap Haitian. This is a street scene that uh, very much could be the French Quarter of New Orleans, except for the street activity. And embedded in the photograph, there's a little bit of a Creole thing happening. I'll show you the detail. El Criollito. Even though the, the Haitians, of course, speak Creole a lot, the other side of the island is Spanish-speaking. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, of crossing there. And I did learn one interesting Creole world, uh, word while I was in Haiti. The, the, the word for little, little is itty bitty. <laughs> so I think that's just wonderful because Creole languages, the way they incorporate things from other languages and blend them in and make something new out of it. I thought that was, uh, I don't know if they heard that on a cartoon on TV and thought it was really <laughs> cute and they, hey, let's, let's go with that. Uh, another scene from Cap Haitian, and, and these are true Creole cottages, just like we have in, in Louisiana. And one thing I'll point out, you see the street names have uh, uh, numbers and um, letters. And uh, that's because during the U.S. occupation of Haiti in the early 20th century, the U.S. military deemed the French names too difficult to pronounce. So they changed them to letters and numbers. But occasionally you'll see one of the old French plaques. It's, uh, it's in French, but it's pretty rare. They're almost all gone. Another scene from Cap Haitian with architecture very evocative of, uh, of Louisiana uh, Creole architecture. Here's a scene. One thing that I would do, I photographed in Haiti post-earthquake, which was 2010. And any time I saw a building that I felt like it may not survive. It may be torn down eventually. I would always photograph it. And that's what I was doing here. And one thing that I would do is I would be there. I'm out on the street. I'm obviously photographing the building. So people would pause. But I would always wave them through. And they would go because they think, oh, he's photographing the building. He's going to let us pass and then uh, take his picture. But if they do something really interesting while they're in the frame, I would take the picture. And that happened here. And I would love the way all the, the the women in Haiti would carry things on their head, which I have not seen it uh, in, in my era in New Orleans, but if you look at the old photographs of the French Quarter from the early 20th century, uh, and these would be photographers like Francis Benjamin Johnston and Arnold Genthe, uh, who, who documented uh, the, the French Quarter in the 19-teens and 20s, you would see the Creole women carrying baskets on their head going to the French market. Here's a gingerbread. This is in Laogon, which is where the epicenter actually was, the epicenter of the 2010 earthquake. And this is a building I'm sure is probably not going to survive. Um, I was intrigued by the little barber shop. You see barber shops all over Haiti like that in little kiosks. Uh, and um, you can see that the, the building technique there with the heavy timber frame filled in with brick. Uh, that's common in Louisiana. We have that same type of architecture. Uh, it, it's called a, a columbage. 
uh, where they build a heavy frame of wood and then just fill it in with brick in between. And that's the way this is constructed. And so they were doing it in Haiti as late as the late 19th century. Now, to go back to the Louis, and these are a couple of things that actually aren't in the book, but I just wanted to show because they're interesting, so something extra. This house has that same construction technique, by the way. You can't see the, the timbers because it's all covered over with stucco. But the second floor, it's wood masonry base with wood frame above. And this is just a classic, classic French colonial building with that steep roof with the side hips. And uh, the, it, it comes from Normandy. And uh, this is in Point Capi Parish on the Maison Chenal. And here, look, here's a little house in rural Cuba with the same roof, much more modest house. I suspect, given where this is, that this came directly from uh, Haiti to, to Cuba rather than, I don't think that's a Louisiana connection going back the, the other way. But I have no way of knowing. But I, I <laughs> remarked on the roof. I, I had to stop and photograph it when I saw that, that French roof in the middle of Cuba. Oops, wrong button again. There we go. Took a second. And here, in Jacques Mel in Haiti, it's not a great photograph of the building. That's one of the reasons it's not in the book. I really couldn't. This truck was broken down and sort of permanently there. Uh, and, uh, but you see the same roof that big French umbrella, which would be supported by a Norman truss underneath. Um, here's a house, not particularly old. This was in Rio Negro. Uh, but I was intrigued by the pigeons because Louisiana Creoles always raise pig pigeons. And in the rural sites, in the, in the plantation buildings, the main principal house would always be flanked by two ornamental pigeonniers. And they would eat, eat pit, they would eat squab, the pigeons, and they would use the guano for the kitchen garden to fertilize. And so it was just one of these uh, parts of, of Creole culture. So I was intrigued by this improvised pigeon coat here that had been uh, 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 put on the side of the house. Here's what a Louisiana pigeonier looks like. And uh, they would always put them in the, in the front garden. And here's a Haitian pigeon there that was put together. But notice how they do try to, with the, the, the way they did the roof there, uh, and the, the tall, narrow form. It's a very, very vernacular, simplified version of the, you know, the more formal one. This is near Cartagena. This is one of the more abstract things that reminded me of Louisiana. This is in Cano del Oro. This is a, the ruin of a hospital at a leper colony. And the most famous leper colony in the United States is Indian Camp in Louisiana, which is on the River Road. So I immediately thought of Indian Camp, although Indian Camp doesn't look anything like this. But the thing that really reminded me of the New Orleans is that street. We have a kind of a drainage problem in New Orleans. You might have heard about it. Uh, and frequently in the spring and after hurricanes, uh, we have to deal with water in the street. Flooded streets are, are common and, uh, you know, causes lots of problems. It's, it's, a, it's a constant nuisance. And it was interesting to see these folks coping with the same situation. Here's a street scene from Central Havana, which uh, one of the things that I tried to show in many, many times in the photographs, there's kind of an intimate attitude towards the street in Latin America. And in, in New Orleans and Louisiana, it's kind of regarded as a mixed-use public space. And we're always, in New Orleans, everybody's always out in the street all the time, blocking traffic. And all of it kind of mingling together, where it's not just for cars. And, and that's one of the wonderful things about Havana, is people are in the street walking on bicycles. There's very few cars. Uh, and so there's just a lot of street activity. So I juxtapose this shot uh, with this one. This is Bourbon Street and the Wallens on a Saturday night. And I'm sort of cheating a little bit because most of these people are tourists. But one of the things that we discovered in New Orleans a long time ago is 
if you get enough liquor in all these Anglo-Protestants, they'll really start being more uh, Catholic Creole in their attitude about things. And I wish there were an easier way because all that liquor can't be good for you. But at any rate, uh, it's, uh, we see that. And there are two streets, and they don't block Bourbon Street off during the day, but that doesn't deter people from, you know, being in the street all day. Here's a quieter scene in uh, central Havana at night at a corner store. And we have these all over New Orleans, you know, with the cut corner uh, throughout all the residential neighborhoods. And they're everything from bar rooms to uh, little cafes and restaurants um, and formerly grocery stores, although there's very few of those, and, and what we call in New Orleans po' boy joints. They're just places that serve po' boys and beer usually. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think it's one of the things that it's emblematic of, of, of uh, neighborhoods in Latin America where there's more mixed use. It, things aren't as separated from each other as they are in, say, most of the rest of North America. Now here's a photograph that could only be taken in, in Havana, obviously. And at first I didn't like it because, you know, everybody goes to Havana and they come back with a photograph of an old car on the street. <laughs> but I thought this was kind of special because of, you know, the blue clothes hanging to dry, the blue building, the blue car, all of it together. And then I really liked it when somebody told me that, oh, you know, the Cuban government employs tourist operatives to put the cars, whether they're running or not, to put them in a picturesque spot for the tourists to look at. So once I had an unwitting collaborator, I thought, well, this is, this is really great. Somebody put that car there because they thought, hey, it looks good in front of this building. <laughs> this is another building that intrigued me. And I put this in specifically because of Coral Gables. First of all, I love the name La Maravilla, is the marvel. Uh, and it's quite a marvel. And those are banyan trees growing out of the side of the building, which I know you have to be quite familiar with, and you know what's going to happen in about 100 years. Somebody is going to have to deal with that. But um, <laughs> it's um, so much of the old architecture in Havana, and a lot of it in New Orleans, too, is, is, uh, is like this, and sort of an end of an era. Uh, and you hope that it will get restored. Here's a scene that you would probably think, well, this doesn't remind, this is nothing like New Orleans. And in a way it isn't. This is Quito, in a modern suburb of Quito. And this level of density, uh, which is common to Latin American cities, particularly the big ones, uh, never really materialized in New Orleans, except in death. The New Orleans cemeteries are just jumbled together, these necropolises of the dead. And uh, this is St. Louis I, the oldest uh, extant cemetery in New Orleans. It's right behind the French Quarter. And you can see all this grand architecture just jumbled together like that. One of the things that we also have that are common throughout the Catholic world are society tombs as grand monumental final resting places uh, became the norm in the Catholic world. People of ordinary means needed that too. Hence, you would have the society tombs where you could be buried in a, in a, in a, in a vault tomb within the, the society tomb. And I was intrigued by this one. This is in San Diego Cementerio in Quito a society tomb for cab and truck drivers. <laughs> and I haven't seen it. A, a friend of mine told me that they had seen a society tomb for hairdressers in Puerto Rico, which I thought that was quite good, too, and very <laughs> fitting. You know, they can do things with hair that the Catholic Church doesn't approve of. Um, here's a building that's a, that's a really great example of why I photograph uh, buildings um, uh, at this point. Uh, in their existence. Uh, this is uh, Club Cartagena, the Grand Social Club in Cartagena. And when I saw it, I first thought, 
what in the world is this French Beaux Arts building doing in Cartagena? But it turns out it's a French architect who was a disciple of Garnier, and that's why it looks like the Opera House in Paris, uh, except for the color. It's, everything's right about it but the color, and that, of course, is the, the Creole touch. Inside, there's a grand courtyard, and then in the back, the building uh, was built about mid-1920s, and then in 1944, they added this expansive dance floor at the back of it. With, you can see in the terraza, Cartagena, 1944. Uh, so that was a significant addition onto the back. Then underneath this dance floor, where they had a bar service on either side, open to the sky, very tropical, Underneath, at the very last use of the building, uh, it became a hip-hop lounge. Uh, and I have a friend that I went to school with, Antonio Escobar, no relation to Pablo, who uh, uh, has a place in Cartagena. So I asked Antonio if he knew anything about this hip-hop club, and he didn't know. So I asked his kids, and I showed him the picture, and they said, oh yeah, we went there in the late 90s, the early 2000s, the DJ was Chuchu Romero from Miami. And so I really love that cycle of a Latino from Miami bringing hip hop to Cartagena. And the, the thing about Club Cartagena, it's now owned by uh, a large developer. They bought up this, they bought this building, they bought up surrounding property, and it's going to be renovated. And they think probably a five star hotel. And so they're probably not going to memorialize the hip-hop lounge. That's probably going to go. So that little piece of the building's history, which was its very last use in phase one, uh, is, is probably going to be erased. And so um, it's one of the reasons I'm drawn to old buildings, because they're so full of history, of the, their evolution over time as well. Here's a photograph. This is New Orleans. This is George DeRose's studio. George died recently. My studio was a block from his. I was on the Marigny side. He was on the French Quarter side. Uh, and George would do paintings. He had this thing for um, amputees. And he would, he would photograph, uh, uh, do studies uh, of uh, amputees, and he would paint them in these allegorical paintings that he did. And an interesting story is uh, uh, George was visited in the 80s by this young gay New York photographer who had come to New Orleans to visit, see what was going on. And he, he met George and he went to George's studio. And that was Robert Maplethorpe. And so he went back to New York and started doing nudes, not of, you know, people with uh, missing limbs, but uh, kind of did his own thing with it. But it's kind of interesting and, and it, for George's memorial, the photograph of George was a Robert Maplethorpe photograph that he had taken in, in New Orleans in the 80s. So anyway, this is a severed foot off a statue that somebody gave George, and he slept with it. And I, uh, I juxtaposed that with the ex votos at the St. Rock Shrine at St. Rock Cemetery, San Roque, uh, patron saint of, of the incurable. And so it's not done so much anymore. But uh, certainly in this neighborhood, a working class neighborhood, this is in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans, a neighborhood that you heard a lot about post-Katrina. Here's a house. This is in the Treme. This is a house with a very deep Creole history. And as you can see, it's a, a classic New Orleans townhouse. And um, it was originally built for Louise Vitry, whose family came from Haiti. And she was in placage uh, with a Frenchman, uh, uh, Corel, who had a European Creole wife in the French Quarter. Uh, but the mixed race family was here in the Treme. And it's now lived in by Will Germain and his partner, Mauricio Colmenares, who's from Bogota. So they sort of became my new age postmodern Creole family. Uh, and they live in it. As you can see, it's kind of a ruin inside, but they're, they're very respectful of the house and uh, keep it together as best they can. And a lot of people in New Orleans kind of live in this sort of, uh, that these old houses are a lot of work. 
uh, as uh, you can imagine. And so this is, this is a, a great one in a great neighborhood right around the corner from uh, Peter Claver Church, uh, which is in the Treme, and that's the, 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 the main Catholic church in this community. The last photograph is a super dumb. This is something you wouldn't normally think of as Creole. So as you can see, 240 pages later, I'm still kind of looking through the back door. This is, this is the back door view of the Superdome. This is not the front door view. This is the view from Central City uh, uh, on uh, the uptown side of the Superdome. And uh, I wanted to end the book in the most abstract kind of way because for me the essence of what Creole is, it's mixing old and new together and quite frequently they are things that you don't think about as going together. But by necessity, that is a result of circumstances beyond your control and adversity, you have to, uh, you have to learn to put things together. And I'll tell you a little Creole story about a dish that you all know, jambalaya, which you might have had in um, if you've ever been to New Orleans, you can probably get it here. It's a famous dish. Well, it is the, the origin of it is, uh, is pretty logical when you think about it. We all know the Spanish rice dish paella. Okay. The French name for ham is jambon. Jambon paella, creolized into jambalaya. So anyway, nothing to do with the Superdome, but uh, a Creole story. So. We see here the, the, probably what is the greatest landmark, and I, I, I tell people, you know, uh, Rome has the Colosseum, Florence has the Duomo, New Orleans has the Superdome. So I can hardly sit here with a straight face and say that the Superdome is a Creole Duomo, but I'm kind of saying that. And uh, where else, except Creole Catholic society, would you give an NFL football team an ecclesiastical name? But we do. Uh, you went for aquatic mammals here, but uh, we went for the saints in New Orleans. Of course, the saints do perform miracles, so uh, that, that is maybe not such a bad thing. So I'll conclude with this, and I'll, I'll be glad to take questions if there are any. I have a blog about Creole World, which is on, on Tumblr there. Also uh, hosted on Vimeo are some videos about the making of Creole World. Uh, my website, my publisher's uh, website there, and also uh, my gallery, a gallery for fine photography in, in New Orleans there at the bottom. So for those of you who are gluttons for punishment and want to get more of this, you can continue the dialogue here. So uh, that's it. Thanks for coming. I'll be glad to answer questions at this point if you have any. Uh -huh. But it, you know, it's such a uh, unique place, you know, everything's amazing, you know, architecture, food, and so forth. And music. And music, and music, and music, music. Yeah. But a couple of things that I hear from Native and all of you is that uh, post Katrina, you have a lot of people who have moved from other states. Yeah, headsters from Brooklyn, <laughs> primarily. So they obviously are bringing their own classes and so forth, and some of those, and they're trying to impose those in, according to the, the, the yeah. people that are supposed to be there. Well, I think for the most part, these people are real Bohemians. The people that are too funky for Brooklyn are ending up in New Orleans. And there's a long tradition there. I don't know, basically, I don't know whether to worry about it yet or not. But the, the French Quarter, when it was a slummy neighborhood, I mean, that's where Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, William Faulkner, they were all there. None of those people are from New Orleans. Well, Truman Capote it was, I mean, but he didn't grow up in New Orleans. He told everybody he was born at the Monteleon Hotel, which was, he was born at Toro Infirmary. But he, his father was a New Orleanian, but he didn't grow up there. So he's the only one of those that I mentioned that had any connection. But all of those writers wrote about New Orleans and they came to describe it and be a part of the scene there that became very important to the city. And a number of musicians have come there 
too, that are from other places, but they love the music, they want to learn that music, they want to play with New Orleans musicians. Same thing with people that are into food. Um, they're going there. So I think that cities always, it's just going to, in my view, it's just going to add to the Creole mix. Maybe it, I don't know if it's going to get more standardized or weirder. Uh, it's hard to say uh, about that, but and, and besides the hipsters from Brooklyn, there's also a huge uh, Honduran population that's, that's been there for a long, long time, but it's really growing because of the economic problems in Honduras now. Everybody's trying to get out of there if they can, and a lot of them are coming to New Orleans because they have family there. So it's always, there's always going to be new people. There's always going to be new people. And as they say about New Orleans is not a thriving place like Miami. And uh, they say about New Orleans, it's like, uh, you know, the women go off and they go to school and so forth and they, they marry people that are not from New Orleans and they eventually make them move back there and that's how they repopulate the city. Uh, uh, is because there's a, there's a particular fondness. If you're from New Orleans and if you live there, it's kind of difficult to be another place because it's like all the things that you take for granted, you know, Mardi Gras and Go Cups and the food and the music, you just don't find that everywhere. So. I think so. I, I, there were a lot of reasons. Um, I, I was a southerner. I wanted to come back to the south. And be, before I left the south, moving to California, thinking I would never come back again. Once that happened, even before I left, I'd said, well, if I ever come back, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to move to New Orleans because it's not really southern. And what I tell people today is I'm the world's laziest American expatriate because I haven't had to leave the country except in spirit. And I actually have a place in Florida in the Panhandle, so I can come over here if I need anything major that I need to get done that requires efficiency and for bureaucracy to work and for all of that. I can come to Florida and get things taken care of pretty simply. So, but it is a place apart. It really is, and I think that was a big reason. Yeah. Place to park is nice. uh, no, uh, New, yeah. Orleans New Orleans is, a, but that, that's also true of Miami. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Miami is wonderful a wonderful your pictures, the perspective, the way I mean I just was uh -huh. perfect and I came a little late, but I really congratulate this review. Um, for instance there was one of them that I wanted to ask you where were you I didn't want to interrupt you at that time. Oh uh, yes. Where did you uh, in that in that area that you say that all of the cultures are uh, together and I was going to ask you, where were you standing to table? I mean, it looks like the upper, upper. What was it? Was it a street scene that you're describing? I'm having the trouble. The street scenes are superb. Uh, you're describing it. It was in Colombia. <coughs> was that in Cartagena? I think it was in Cartagena. Cartagena. I think that it was in Cartagena. You were describing the people, and there was a mixture of people oh. standing outside. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that was Havana, I think. Oh, that was Havana. Havana. No. When I was talking about the people in the street. These are buildings. The buildings. People, buildings that you were shown from up. I wish I that. You know what? When I'm going to be here to sign. But show me in the book. Show me in the book, and we'll, we'll, we'll get that straightened out because I'm having. in the street. I happened to live for a while in Panama. When you describe El Chorrillo, oh, yes. that neighborhood is so uh, very well. I know, and the terrible thing about El Chorillo, I stayed in El Chorillo in the Did 70s. You? I could not even get a cab driver to drive me through. No, I, had to hire, I had to hire a policeman, an uh, off-duty <laughs> policeman who patrolled that neighborhood, and then I was still only able to shoot for about three hours. Somebody got shot, like, in the next... Uh, and they were blaming me because they thought that they, people didn't want... You photographers. But I, I used to go to El Torillo with, with people who lived there. Yes. But my question is, do you remember more approximately what, what year was that? Or 74 when I stayed there, and I was there in 2007, I believe. But the problem with El Torillo, you know, uh, the U.S. government bombed El Torillo and occupied El when they were going after Manuel Noriega. That's, <laughs> well, a, that's the war nobody's remembered. That was 1989. And when he was arrested, and he came, and it was a, certainly a big deal in Miami. Uh, but yeah, they destroyed that neighborhood. They, we bombed their historic district in Panama. I was here when I heard the whole story. When I used to live there, I used to give 
classes to their children in the school I was teaching mm -hmm. French. Very and, interesting. And Alteria. You were teaching yeah. French in Alteria? No. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, I was teaching in a school where the, the children of Torrijos went. Tori it was uh, the uh -huh. best, best school over there, but it went a lot of people uh -huh. from a private school. Once. I see. But uh, there were students with the last name Noriega, which finally I found out Noriega was not as known, but was the right hand of Torrijos. Sure. Torrijos is the one of the Carter Torrijos Treaty with Panama to give the canal, to return the Panama Canal to the Panamanian. Yeah. That yes. Was those days. That's what that was all about, really, because Jimmy Carter actually honored an agreement. The yeah, original agreement call for turning it over, but that became a real major platform. And uh, but you know who else is from El Chorillo? That is a really uh, the the great boxer Roberto Duran. Duran was from El Chorillo. I see from there. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Could you make some mention of the construction industry, which was dominated by the African French Creole? That's right. In New Orleans, in particular, and there's a parallel with the Modejo. In, in Cuba, I think. The uh, people of mixed race, the ethnic Creoles, the Afro-Creoles of New Orleans were the tradesmen. They were the plasterers, the carpenters, the furniture makers, uh, and uh, that was kind of their, their thing. And that is written about in great detail in J. Edwards' essay in the book. Most of this architecture that you're seeing uh, was built by people of mixed race. And that was what they were well known for. And it was, a lot of it was being done during the time of slavery. New Orleans had the largest um, population of free blacks uh, anywhere in the United States uh, prior to the Civil War. And it was, it was about, at the high point, it was close to 30% of the, of the black and mixed race population was free. Uh, and that was a unique situation. You didn't see that in the rest of the American South uh, in the slave states. Uh, and they were tradesmen for the most part. And that has continued to the present day, uh, that they are still uh, uh, in the building trades. Well, I think we have time for one more question and then we'll get to science. Okay. I just thought it was funny that you mentioned the exodus of hipster Brooklynites because my nephew, who lives on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, is just and his ex-boyfriend are considering moving to New Orleans and kind of testing the waters there. Uh -huh. And some of your references that you made um, in the talk, I mean, we all know that New Orleans is, you know, the mecca of jazz and the mecca of foodies to a certain extent. But, but some of the things that you said made me lead, led me to believe that perhaps it was like a gay mecca as well to some extent. Would you say that that is an accurate characterization well. or inaccurate? Uh, certainly, there's a, there's a very large gay population in, uh, in New Orleans. And I think it has been kind of on a regional basis, certainly nothing like San Francisco would be, or the, um, or the village uh, in New York, less so than that, but it would, it would be up there as one of those places. I think that... Um, people from New Orleans to, for, I mean, because in the, to that, to, traditionally to. in the black community in the United States, um, no, not go home and Google Big Frida. <laughs> okay, uh, there's, uh, anything goes, <laughs> anything goes in New Orleans. I mean, um, it's just, uh, it's not, it's, it's a libertine kind of place. I don't think it's very judgmental about anything. I mean, um, the, if you look at the strip clubs and, and, and everything that goes on in New Orleans, uh, it's, it's, it's really kind of a very open society. And um, I think that uh, there's, you know, I lived in San Francisco and I, I, don't, I don't see any difference between, say, the overall general attitude towards uh, the gay population is, is not any different between the two places there. There's always going to be people that are, you know, uh, saying this or that, but I think New Orleans is a very accepting place. In fact, the people that have kind of 
criticizing the hipsters are drawing more criticism than, you know, the hipsters for the most part because it's like that's, that's kind of controversial. I think the, the, the real controversy there for me is the fact that any time you want to use the notion of, of Creole and Creolization to, stand, to, to sort of define any kind of level of purity, you're on thin ice. So if, if you want to freeze it in time, it's not going to happen. You know, it's going to keep evolving in free-form fashion. And I think that's, that's the hallmark of it, and that's what's wonderful about it. And what I try to use with New Orleans is a very positive example. I mean, people, most people really like New Orleans. And what is New Orleans? It's a multiracial, multilingual, multicultural city, and it has been for 300 years. So I think, hey, give it a chance. If it doesn't work, we can, you know, we can, we can abandon it. But if it works, you hold on to it. That's the way culture evolves. The good stuff, you say, hey, this is great, and it gets copied by everybody. If it's not any good, it's like, okay, let's don't try that one again. But it's sort of self, it's a self-healing process. Thank you, okay. Richard. Thank you all very much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We really appreciate that. We have all of Richard's other books, which are just as miraculous as this one, for sale behind the counter. He will be signing them right over here for you. I'm sure he'll ask some more questions. Uh, you can answer some more questions for him. And those of you watching online, give us a call. We'll get one signed, and we'll ship it to you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you.